The lights have all but gone out in Gaza after the fifth day of continuous shelling from the Israeli side. The lone power plant on the Gaza Strip uh, has shut down for lack of fuel, uh, leaving only the nighttime shelling uh, to give breaks from uh, otherwise the all-encompassing uh, darkness in Gaza right now. Casualty figures on both sides are mounting, and while the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations has called on the international community to urge for a humanitarian ceasefire, Israel is set to form an emergency wartime government. Is this the final step, we ask, uh, before a ground invasion of Gaza by the Israeli military? And in Indonesia, labor unions have condemned the constitutional court's uh, ruling on the issuing of a government regulation instead of the job creation law, which trade unions had challenged. Unions are also demanding uh, that the government accept uh, a 15 percent increase in minimum wage. What is this omnibus law and how are workers exactly fighting against it? All this on today's episode of Daily Debrief, uh, brought to you by People's Dispatch. Take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Gaza is on the verge of a full-blown humanitarian uh, catastrophe. It's two million plus residents, many of whom have nothing to do, of course, with Hamas, are facing collective punishment from Israel after the unprecedented attacks by sea, air and land uh, within Israeli territory. Um, as they have for the better part of two decades now, of course, they've faced these kind of conditions, uh, the blockade by Israel, uh, an open-air prison, it's been described as often. But the sheer scale of destruction this time, the loss of life and violence, is unprecedented. On the Israeli side, uh, media reports indicate that the death toll is over 1,200. And engagements continue both in the south, which is of course the border with Gaza, and with, uh, at the northern border with Lebanon, where there have been incidents or incidents have been reported between the Israeli military and Hezbollah fighters. At the United Nations, the Palestinian ambassador uh, held a press conference. Uh, he also met with senior UN officials and asked for the international community, including the UN Security Council, uh, to uh, enforce or to push for a humanitarian ceasefire to allow for aid to enter, uh, for people to be evacuated, for essential supplies to be brought in, and for some relief uh, to be brought to the people uh, of Gaza. He's also said that the governments of Egypt and Jordan are willing to step up to the plate, with his words, and help. And other nations, including, of course, the Security Council, as I was saying earlier, uh, need to step up as well to push for an immediate end to the fighting. Meanwhile, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden reiterated the United States' full support uh, to Israel. Military aid is going in. Uh, and the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, will be in Israel soon. Uh, Anish is following uh, developments in Gaza and in Israel uh, as he has been uh, since last week and is with us on the show. Let's go across now to him for the latest. Anish, uh, fifth day of shelling. First of all, uh, what updates uh, are you receiving uh, from reporting that is uh, coming in? So, Sadant, what we're looking at is tragic tragedy unfolding in various ways right now in the Gaza Strip. Uh, one of the things that you rightly pointed out is the fact that uh, the entire area of land is now without electricity because the last power plant ran out of fuel. Uh, now most Gazans uh, would have to depend on the kind of rationings that the uh, authorities there, uh, pretty much led by uh, Hamas at this point, uh, will, uh, will be rationing on uh, whatever little fuel they have to conserve uh, you know, it for emergency services and also probably for military action. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you also have complete lockdown, as we have been talking about for a while. Now that they have actually what they call as securing the borders, uh, uh, you know, with Gaza, uh, it has pretty much been a complete lockdown. And there is no way for even humanitarian corridor to actually make through, uh, make way into Gaza for aid, for medicines, for, you know, emergency supplies of all sorts, uh, something that should not be, you know, uh, 
undermined or you know uh, disturbed uh, during a war or during a military crisis uh, but something that israel doesn't give two hoots about as far as far as we can see right now uh, what they are looking at and what, uh, from the statements that we have seen from the israeli authorities as well uh, you have uh, you know the the homeland security the national security minister talking about uh, how uh, calling gazans uh, human animals or human beasts uh, and talking about how they will have to be dealt with that uh, like animals um, and then you have the uh, the netanyahu uh, uh the prime minister netanyahu talking about how uh, you know it has to be uh, a war till the end and now we are also looking at uh, you know calls for a unity government a war cabinet of sorts uh benny gans of the blue and white uh, coalition has already uh, you know put in uh, his favor on the matter and said said that they will be part of a new uh, national unity government and will be part of the war cabinet Uh, it is quite likely that uh, Yair Lapid of uh, uh, another opposition leader and currently the main opposition leader in the Knesset uh, will be uh, also trying to join, but he has certain conditionalities. One of which is basically he wants the war, if it goes on, uh, to be fought till the end and not be, you know, there not be any compromises. So basically, even the opposition, some of the major opposition in Israel is right now. uh calling for total all out war against all gazans and we are looking at uh not just hamas they they do not make any distinction at this point between hamas and gazans or any palestinians we are they, we are looking at a government a regime that is actually uh keen on imposing collective punishment on over 2 million people and without any care for international laws or international customs or any pressures at this point for that matter and, and uh, also continued reports on each of uh, troop build up the build up of uh, military equipment and other materials uh, stocks and supplies uh, on the border uh, we've been uh, sort of uh, talking about and, and and examining the possibility of a ground invasion is that becoming more and more likely and and with some of this talk that is coming from other uh, political leaders in israel that even make benjamin netanyahu uh, sound like a relative uh, you know relative moderate leader. yeah yeah, yeah a moderate leader it's, it's exactly. uh, it doesn't point to sort of very encouraging uh, in a very encouraging direction exactly uh, the the more days it lags on the air strikes continue uh the more likely it seems that a ground invasion uh is imminent uh and uh, that's actually going to be a significant disaster if it actually happens because that has that hasn't happened uh since perhaps 1967 i guess uh where an all out war uh, with thousands of israeli troops uh, trying to storm into uh gaza is a likelihood at this point but uh it's it's uh, that's how conditions have come to at this uh, point in time but we also have to look at how the israeli response has been like relatively slow they are calculating because obviously a lot of their strategy has was compromised by hamas's offensive and this uh, resistance movement's offensive actually kind of undermined whatever major dip- like this uh, w- we talk about uh, the image of impenetrability and invincibility but there's also the fact that th- it was a major and catastrophic uh, military intelligence failure that is something that they are yet to recoup from in a manner that they can actually form a coherent front and that is something i don't want to get into but this is pretty much why there is a uh, you know relatively slower response it actually took them days to secure the the so called secure the borders uh, with gaza uh, it clearly shows that there was a problem with uh, command at that level uh, because obviously their uh, existing strategies their drills their uh, their plans were pretty much compromised by this offensive and that is what uh, you know kind of also is uh, lagging uh, right now even if they want to actually uh, you know look for an invasion into one of the most densely populated territories in the world right now 
Uh, mm-hmm. On the other hand, uh, this is coming with some level of very overt uh, support from the uh, from the United States, the kind that we have never seen before, and that is uh, going to, that is pretty much emboldening uh, the kind of uh, you know very uh, very pro war, very violent rhetoric that we are seeing among Israeli leadership, with very very few and rare exceptions. Uh, like you, uh, like some in the Labour Party uh, calling out the government for using terms like, you know, de- uh, deeming uh, Gazans to be human beasts and stuff like that. So there are very, very, fa- very rare voices of sanity. But apart from that, uh, a large part of the uh, Israeli elite have and the ruling classes have actually taken to this, you know, consensus that they have to invade. They have to uh, give a more if not equal, but more violent response against, uh, uh, you know, Gaza uh, in response to the offensive. And that is going to create a bigger tragedy, a bigger catastrophe that the Middle East might have never seen before. Yeah, uh, if we can talk a bit more on the subject of the United States, of course, and its involvement uh, in in the region, uh, Anish, uh, Militarily, there's of course no comparison between the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, what, what are called the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, and of course Hamas and, and whatever allies uh, it might have in the region. Uh, Israel being one of the strongest uh, militaries in the world, according to various reports published by uh, global think tanks and, and uh, other organized institutions. Uh, and yet, military aid from the U.S., uh, like you were pointing out, continues to pour in high-tech uh, military aid, Iron Dome, uh, for example, uh, replenishments, uh, F-35 fighter jets. Of course, there's also the sending of uh, carrier battle groups. Aircraft uh, carriers, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so these are not um, toys and and things to be trifled with, Anish. Uh, Anthony Blinken is also set to visit uh, at some point, probably pretty soon. Uh, how does the diplomatic aid and the military aid uh, to Israel uh, kind of? Uh, what is the, what would be the purpose of of this visit, uh, and, and what further can the U.S. really do to embolden uh, what is already a far right uh, leadership? Well, at this point, what, one of the things that we have to talk about is the fact that uh, in past U.S. presidencies, uh, while they have always uh, turned a blind eye to Israeli atrocities on the Palestinians and on Palestinian lands, uh, and obviously like the continued colonization uh, of Palestine, uh, there is uh, there is a certain difference in how when you turn a blind eye and when you go out go all out in support of uh, you know a regime that is intent to commit genocide it has really openly called for uh, you know wiping out gaza of the map and uh, you have many members in the government in the political leadership uh, talking about these things and the us is completely fine with that at this point and, and this this clearly shows a very uh, you know change in stance uh from what past u.s administrations had done uh prim- mostly they would be very pro-israel obviously and pretty much all in for all intents and purposes but they would not really be seen you know condoning atrocities so openly or wars that were initiated by israel that openly it was almost always like israel has the right to defense and you know, uh, it is uh, it. Uh, we stand against terrorist uh, terrorism and stuff like that. But never really, you know, giving all out uh, support in the manner in which it is doing right now. And that is something that is far more disconcerting. But obviously, uh, U.S. is not likely to be directly involved at this point either, because uh, right now, the even the sending of the U.S. Uh, you know, the aircraft carrier into the Mediterranean and inching it closer to israel is basically just a move against any kind of uh, outside help that uh, hamas might get say from you know hezbollah or what it what the u.s claims might happen with is iran in uh, being involved or maybe any other uh, you know uh, outside forces 
uh, outside the territories of Israel and Palestine. So this is pretty much a preemptive detente that the U.S. is trying to push. Uh, uh, we have to wait and see how far that goes. But what we need to understand is that Hamas is quite aware and, you know, many of its allies and even Palestinians are quite aware of how this is, uh, um, uh, you know, not a war between equals. It is uh, so they are going to be having a different kind of guerrilla warfare that has never been seen before in recent memory. And this is not something that Israel itself would want to uh, actually be involved in at this point in time. But definitely uh, from the trajectory that we are seeing, uh, there is no pressures from up, uh, be above Israel that is actually preventing it from going forward with this plan. And this uh, is despite uh, you know, the condemnations from its neighbors. Uh, Arab nations are currently, as we speak, uh, holding a meeting uh, in Cairo, foreign ministers meeting, and they are trying to decide on their path forward on you know Gaza and the Israeli aggression. So, and despite that, none of the, those pressures are matter really because Israel pretty much heeds only to U.S. or European pressures, and there is pretty much complete support at this point in time. And that is what the most concerning part is: how, like the West, has clearly come out in favor of Israel, pretty much for all intents and purposes, even to the extent of supporting genocidal calls and that is something that is n that really needs to be not just called out it needs to be pretty much uh you know brought to light to a point that it actually makes a difference eventually yeah condemned in as harsh terms as uh, as we have to condemn all uh, sort of uh, civilians who have been targeted in the course of uh, this current conflict Anish, we'll, we'll leave uh, Gaza uh, for the moment or for this episode. At least thanks for those updates. But we'll be back with you in a second But because we're talking about uh, Indonesia. And of course, Southeast Asia is a region that you cover uh, for People's Dispatch on a regular basis. Uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, coming back to you in just a second. Uh, because in Indonesia, as I was mentioning at the top of the show, organized labor is mounting pressure on the Widoda government to accept its demands for a 15% increase in uh, the minimum wage in that country, uh, while of course also alongside continuing uh, its struggle against the omnibus uh, law on job creation, which the government has uh, pushed through and uh, and now the constitutional court in Indonesia has also uh, rejected an appeal by trade unions uh, against the passage of that law. The Labour Party of Indonesia and trade unions said that uh, in light of the government already having increased the salaries of civil servants, the likes of the army, uh, the police, and even some uh, pensioners, um, as well as, of course, the omnibus law, there are urgent grounds for it to accept uh, demands for a higher minimum wage. Uh, Anish, how strong is this uh, sort of labor movement in Indonesia uh, making these demands, and, and uh, how much pressure are they able to sort of uh, exert on? Uh, well, the trade union movement in Indonesia is quite extensive. And uh, like we have seen uh, during the protests and rallies that have happened in uh, against the uh, against the so-called omnibus law or what is what the government calls the job creation uh, bill uh, was something that was phenomenal in many respects, because for a very long time, Indonesian labor was a uh, seen conducting the, the level of mass mobilization that we saw during the time. Uh, and uh, that momentum continues in many respects. Uh, the omnibus law continues to be a very contentious uh, piece of legislation. And uh, while uh, the recent uh, judgment was to uh, you know, dismiss uh, the petition against the Against the con uh, the creation of the law, the process of the crea of the creation of this legislation, uh, it were well, there is a yet to be a uh, judgment or a ruling or even for that matter a consideration uh, by the top court for on uh, on the content of the law itself, and that is where uh, we will have to wait and see if there is, there will be any progress uh, in terms of judicial intervention. Uh, but other than that, the fact that uh, workers continue to put pressure on the government and the fact that they are continuing to, uh, you know, uh, combine it with other struggles that, uh, you know, that matter to workers in, in general 
like the minimum wages uh, the demand for a higher minimum wage is something that has been ongoing for a very long time and the current 15% uh, the in a 15 percent as a demand uh, for a hike for next year is something that is uh, that might seem steep but if you look at it uh, indonesia is one of those countries that actually had it worse uh, when it comes to the uh, the recent cost of living crisis uh, the shortage and supply supply chain disruptions that we've seen during the pandemic and after that as well and uh, and because it is a very import dependent country in many respects especially for consumer uh, products and durable goods and all uh, and even food in certain respect uh, it is uh, definitely uh, something that has affected workers far worse than uh, many of its neighbors even and so in this respect uh, this demand is not uh, without its justification uh, there is already a plan by the government, uh, by the Vidodo government, to actually uh, hike uh, government uh, salarymen and pensioners uh, by, uh, you know, giving them a 10 percent to 12 percent uh, raise. And uh, this is already not something that is much uh, lower than what the trade unions are asking for. But it is not. It clearly shows that it is not an impossible demand to happen mm -hmm. for workers at last. And uh, considering that they are aiming at uh, the general elections, uh, it clearly shows that they are uh, aiming at, you know, making and mobilizing working, the working class as a bloc uh, among itself, uh, as a political bloc that can actually make a difference uh, in the upcoming general elections, which is going to be like uh, considering the current political climate will be far more complex than uh, what Indonesia has seen in for a very long time. And so, obviously, uh, if Vidodo wants his success to, successes to continue, has uh, already we are l looking at reports of his son uh, wanting to be the next vice president and might be a running mate for his uh, chosen candidate. So there is definitely, uh, you know, a big stakes, high stakes for him to actually uh, make a decision that will be acceptable to the work, uh, to the trade unions and to the working class at large incentive uh, political incentive uh, for sure uh, anish but what has been the approach in general if if i can ask you uh, briefly uh, of the widodo government towards sort of pandemic recovery and is uh, getting workers back on their feet uh, giving them a bit of stability and a bit of maybe extra spending money uh, is that part of the consideration set well it's very difficult to say because um when you look at his treatment of uh, the demands raised by workers during the you know anti omnibus law protest it's uh, it was pretty much cold shouldering them uh, throughout the entire uh, incident and uh, even like even the amended uh, aspects of the law um, we see the government trying to you know overlook the workers in most cases but nevertheless, the fact that these pressures are working was definitely, uh, you know, it was, uh, illustrated by the fact that they had to actually eventually amend significant sections of the law uh, before it was passed into, you know, a proper legislation. So, the, mm -hmm. and that was something that uh, also came because of uh, the court uh, threat to actually, uh, you know, uh, declare it uh, annulled because of various procedural problems. Um, and also various other issues uh, with the law itself. Um, but the fact that it happened because of massive pressures from the ground shows that they are not some, uh, they are not a block that can be completely ignored. And uh, considering, and as I pointed out, the upcoming uh, elections, general elections, is going to be quite complex for Vidodo, especially who's trying to do something that hasn't been done. Uh, prior, uh, ever since the country became a multi-party ele uh, electoral democracy in the late 90s. And uh, in this case, him trying to form his own coalition, his own political bloc, and create his own legacy and maybe even a dynasty of himself. Uh, it is uh, basically there's a great deal of incentive for him to heed to certain demands that the workers are raising at the government. And the fact that the workers are not really going for compromise here is evident by the fact that they will be demonstrating until the general elections in the national capital 
and uh, that clearly shows that uh, the workers mobilization is uh, uh, is very pretty much intended to pressurize the political leadership and not just widow though we're looking at all sorts of political leadership to be uh, to be sensitive to the workers cause and this is something that will be significant in the upcoming elections because in previous elections we did not see as much focus on workers rights as we did, as we might see in the coming months on the other hand we also need to remember that uh, vidodo is sensitive to uh, certain uh, popular struggles uh, the fact that in uh, recently he uh, admitted to a whole host of crimes that indonesia had committed uh, during and after uh, the military regime and in a way for and paving way for reparations and reconciliation in, in some of these crimes actually shows that he did uh, heed to certain progressive demands on the ground by victims of uh, you know government's excesses so it is not that he's insensitive but he is definitely calculating at his best so that we have to wait and see how far he will take uh, and accept or even consider uh, these demands but definitely they are uh, there to actually make an impact in the uh, in the current political scenario in indonesia all right thanks very much anish uh, feb 14th if i'm not wrong is when that election uh, will happen the biggest single day uh, electoral uh, sort of process in the world and i'm sure we'll have anish uh, back on uh, giving us more in depth updates on the political scenario in indonesia uh, closer to then uh, but meanwhile, uh, we'll bring to a close this episode of Daily Debrief, our coverage of events uh, and developments uh, in Gaza, as well as based on what is happening in Gaza, uh, will continue through the week as things, uh, as reports come in, of course. Uh, in the meantime, we urge you, as always, to get to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and also to not forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.